Okay. Um, well, I'll start by saying thank you very much for bringing me here today. At such an early stage in my career, it's quite an honor to be at this conference among all of these great minds and talking about such important issues. Um, so thank you to the University of Copenhagen for bringing me here. And also thank you to Dr. Peterson for critically analyzing a lot of the statistics that I'm using today in my talk. I also feel grateful that today I have the opportunity to tell you a story. It's a story about the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country that is perhaps now more than ever demanding of the world's attention. It's a country that is as blessed as it is cursed with mineral wealth. The Congo is a country that in 1885 was turned into a privately controlled corporate state by King Leopold II of Belgium. He then appointed himself sole shareholder and chairman of the Congo Free State after naming the capital Leopoldville after himself. Then came Joseph Desiree Mobutu, the famous dictator who ruled for 32 years and tried to rebrand the country with a new name of Zaire and a new currency. He's said by the Congolese to have taken 70% of the mineral wealth of the country for his own gain, while the remaining 30% he gave half to the United States and saved half in case he wanted to help the Congolese. And most recently, this here is Eastern Congo, which has been run over by rebel armies and the countries that support them with money and weapons. The story that I'll tell you today begins with a key element, the spillover from the Rwandan genocide in 1994. These photos are of IDP camps for internally displaced persons, and they were placed way too close to the Rwandan border within Congo. In fact, their location violated international law on the placement of camps precisely because what could happen did happen. The camps served as hotbeds for the organization and reorganization of angry Rwandans who, feeling that they deserve justice, found that their enemy was just over the border. And from Rwanda, there were continuous attacks that were launched into the camps. There are currently a multitude of rebel armies operating in the region, and their stated goals vary. There are armies of Rwandans, such as the FDLR, who are organizing as a political party and want to take back the government. There are armies of Congolese who want to protect their land and their mineral resources. And there are armies from Congo's bordering countries who state national and regional security as their goal. Regardless of the army's goal, they are all using stolen mineral wealth to fund their activities. And it is the weakness of the Congolese state that is allowing them to operate. So what does this mean for the Congolese on the ground? Systematic rape warfare is being used by all armies to inflict a shame so powerful that it disqualifies a victim and her family from the realm of civilized society. A woman who is raped is left by her husband and her family because it is assumed that she is now carrying HIV, the result of an act that she asked for and took pleasure in. When every woman in a village is raped, society dissolves. And this is how rape warfare takes on a systematic character. It's systematic rape warfare only that could be responsible for this number, which is the number of women in the Kivu province of Eastern Congo raped in 2006. And it is this systematic strategy that means that 75% of all rape cases globally treated by MSF are taking place in Eastern Congo. This is a strategy that works. War drives the Congolese out of their homes and shame discourages them from returning. The land then becomes free for the taking. In understanding the health effects of this conflict, it's also important to understand how this degree of brutality seen in these acts is rewarded by Congolese society. Soldiers commit the most horrific and therefore memorable of atrocities because in the past it has served their cause. Guilty of some of the worst human rights atrocities that the Congolese had to ever witness, this is Gabriel Amisi, who the Congolese then had to watch become appointed the chief of their national army. Soldiers are also able to make a name for themselves, in part due to the UN strategy of DDR, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. As the R suggests, this is a strategy that dissolves rebel armies and then reintegrates their soldiers into the national army. As the Congolese say, this means that one can go from rebel warlord to colonel overnight. 
I entered this story when I arrived in Eastern Congo in May of last year. Based out of Heal Africa Hospital, I worked as a birth attendant in the maternity ward and as a researcher for their Safe Motherhood program. Safe Motherhood is one example of a large initiative for maintaining health throughout the conflict. The program attempts to redress both the astonishingly high infant mortality rates that you see here, as well as the country's maternal mortality rate. And here is a rate that continues to haunt me. This is the maternal mortality rate in Eastern Congo registered in 2008. Safe motherhood goes into villages where the war has passed and provides money to purchase materials that have been looted from hospitals. It also trains doctors, midwives, and nurses who are remaining in the village. The program also forms solidarity groups of women who are provided grants so they can buy into micro-insurance programs, which pool their money so that when a member is needing maternal care, money is available. Members also receive training in family planning and income generating activities such as soap and bread making. The challenges in Eastern Congo are as large in number as they are in scope. This is the number of deaths recorded by the IRC from the official beginning of the war in August of 1998 to its official end 10 years later. This number equates to 45,000 deaths per, per month. Of these 5.4 million, 50% are children under the age of five years old. These deaths are not from direct conflict-related violence, but instead fall principally to treatable diseases such as malaria, diarrhea, and malnutrition. This is evidence of a depressed health sector. Overwhelmed and overworked, they are struggling to stay afloat without a life preserver. <laughs> 